Okay, folks, thanks for joining me on my weekend webinar. Um, I'm meeting loads of people. Um, a lot of you saw me on the Etienne Cret interview, which I really enjoyed, Desire to Trade. I think the uh, first part of the interviews had nearly 50,000 views now, so I'm absolutely blown away. Um, and I've had some really great emails and support and communication and subscribers and everything from that. So I'm, I'm really grateful. The second part of the video came out on Thursday, I think it was, and I think that's already hit 5,000 views. So, um, so anyway, it's allowed me to, uh, to meet a lot more people. You've come to my website, some of you. This is my website, daytradeideas.co.uk. Um, I know that my subscriber numbers have jumped on YouTube. So I, and a lot of you have been asking me to make sure that I do the weekend webinar. So here it is. Before I get on with my analysis and trade ideas for the week, I just want to show you that if you haven't been to my website, uh, when you do, you'll get this pop-up uh, uh, questionnaire come up. So if you're interested in my services and talking to me, fill in the questionnaire, it gives me an idea of what you're going through with your trading and what you need to improve. Submit that, I'll receive it, I'll reply to you, and then you can book up, after you've, you've been through that process, you can then book up a free mentor session with me. So no charge whatsoever. Go to this page or this page will come up automatically when you finish the questionnaire and you can just book a time slot with me. Uh, have a chat, 15 minutes. We can go on for longer. If I don't have one straight afterwards, we can go on for 30, 40 minutes. Uh, and I'm not here to help you with your trading. Um, it's not just going to be some sales pitch where I try and get you to subscribe. I genuinely will help you. And I've, I've done that with loads of people lately. And on that subject, uh, some of the things that I've been working on with people uh, so, you know, I've been doing this 35 years and I forget that when, you, when you're starting out trading or even if you've just been trading for a year or two, some of the struggles that you're going through. So it's been a really good exercise for me to, to, to sort of connect with people who are, who are going through the, the difficult things that, that we all struggle with when we first start trading. So one of the things was uh, greed. How do I handle being greedy? How do I handle running trades too long? Um, uh, you know, uh, that, that kind of thing. So for me, the, one of the, here's some of the things that I do or I have advised, and I know that they've worked for some people over the last week or two. So let me just give them to you. If, if you've already heard them, apologies for this. I'll be as quick as I can. Well, well, actually, I'm going to start right from the beginning of how you structure a trade. So the idea, and you, and you know how I structure trades. You know how I find my support and resistance levels. I'm a trend follower, so I'm looking to buy into a support level or in a bull trend when the market retreats to you know, what could be a trend line, a moving average, a Fibonacci level, or preferably a combination of all three. So um, I'm not gonna, I, I will show, be showing you later on how I do that. Now let's assume that you have identified that we're in a bull trend, you've seen the support level, whether it's one that I've identified for you or you've done it yourself. And you're like, right, I'm a trader, so therefore I'm gonna buy at the support level and I'm gonna put my stop in. I usually have around a 30 pip stop. I have a 30 pip stop, but I place the stop below an area where I believe if that area is broken, it confirms that that trade has failed. I don't just have random pip stops. I'm actually looking at shorter term technicals, probably, um, at, well, at least the one hour, maybe even shorter term timeframes, just to identify the minor support levels that if they are broken below the, main, the big support level at which I'm purchasing at, then I'm out of the trade. Now, once I've established what risk I'm prepared to take on the trade, I have to look at the reward. Is the reward worth the trade? So if I'm risking 30 pips, I need to have a target, which is a real, a realistic target, which is 50 pips, 60 pips, or even 100 pips away. You know, I do spot trades where I risk 30 to make 100. That we had uh, several of those last week. If you're a subscriber, you'll know that the uh, dollar Swiss trade, the dollar CAD trade, the breakout of the euro uh, US dollar to the downside. Uh, we had some some trades that were even risking 30 pips to make 300. But anyway, we'll go into that later. So you've got to be looking for those trades. You, uh, the, the, if, if, if you have a 50% hit rate, if half your trades work and half your trades don't, then there's no point in risking 10 pips to make 10 pips because you'll, you'll make nothing in the end. It'll be a load of hard work for nothing. You've got to be risking, or in my case, 30 pips to make more. And then if you, I'm only 50 or 60% right, then I'm still gonna make money as long as my winning trades hit my target. So you've got to be aiming for a greater profit than you're prepared to lose on the trade. I know that most of you know that, but I've come across um, this this week and I just wanted to emphasize that point, especially for you new guys. Right, Sc scaling out of, another of a trade is another thing that I like to do because whether you're doing, your trading is going well or whether it's tr going badly, you have this urge as a human being to bank the profit. You see the profit, you wanna take the profit. And also if you're trade watching, which I don't advise, 
if you're watching the mock price go up and down and up and down and your P&L go up and down and up and down, it's going to drive you crazy and you're going to start second guessing the market and having these thoughts and emotions going through your brain while the trade is open that you really don't need to have. Get out, walk your dog, go to the gym, just do something, read a book. If you've already done all the hard work of the analysis, you figured out where your stop should be, you figured out where your target should be in order to make the risk reward work, then when the trade is on, there's nothing to do. Go, go away, don't look at the screen and let the trade play out. Either let your stop get hit or your target get hit. Okay, maybe monitor it occasionally, maybe once an hour maximum. If you need to move the stop up by five pips because the trade is now 10 to 15 pips in profit, fine, do that. But don't sit there watching every pip. Now, when it comes to exiting the trade, I believe in scaling out. Because as I said, when you, when you hit this profit, uh, when you start hitting your target, you're, you're desperate to take the money. But in the back of your mind, you're thinking, this is a strong bull trend. This is gonna keep going. Why am I getting out now? But you just can't resist the urge. Now, what most people do is they just exit the whole trade. You don't have to do that. You can exit parts of the trade. So let's say you, do, you split the trade into three or four different parts. You can get out of 25 or 30% of the trade when it hits your first target. Okay, so maybe you're trading three pounds a lot or four pounds a lot, or you're trading three or four contracts. Just get out of a fraction of that position. There's, after that, there's two ways that you can play it. So if the market then returns to the entry price, which often it does, it retests the support level, it's an opportunity for you to buy back in. Now you wouldn't be buying, adding to that position if you've already got your full position on the first time the support level was tested. But on the second uh, test, if you've already taken some profit, you, but you still have some of the position on, it allows you to buy back into that amount that you've already taken a profit on. So you, 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 you've got this flexibility. You've still got your stop in, but you can, you can buy back in. You've banked a little bit of profit. You're risking less because you've banked a bit of profit and you're hoping that the market will retest it and then take off again. Or if that doesn't happen, if the market keeps going, it doesn't matter. You've taken some profit, but maybe it goes up another 10 pips. You can take a little bit more profit and a little bit more profit and a little bit more profit. It just, it also helps train you to be able to learn how to run trades and be more comfortable running trades. You're not going to go from running trades to a, for, a, for 20 or 30 pip profit, 40 pip profit to running 100 and 120 pips overnight. It takes some skill. It takes some practice. It takes some confidence building. And I think by scaling out of a trade, that, that allows you to sort of see what happens and get the feeling and get the confidence and get the emotion uh, of dealing with these positions uh, as they continue to move into a profitable uh, situation. Asked about trailing a stop loss. Should I trail my stop loss? How should I trail my stop loss? Uh, okay, so I personally don't believe in aggressively trailing a stop loss. Some people think that it's, uh, or, or use the strategy of as soon as the, the trade goes into profit, move your stop loss to break even as quickly as possible, and then you've got a free trade on. I personally don't agree with that. I'm not saying you shouldn't do it. If it works for you, that's fantastic. I personally don't like to do that because I don't like to exit the trade at the exact price at which I entered it. I don't see the point. I've done all the work. I've worked, you know, I've identified that this is a strong support level in a bull trend. That's where I want to buy. Why would I quickly move my stop up to that point? and then risk getting out of the trade for break even, and then watching the trade take off in the direction that we, in which I thought it was gonna go. As I say, if it works for you, that's fine. For me, it doesn't. So my strategy would, and I'm lazy trading my stops, I'll be honest, I'm lazy. I'm a lazy trader. Um, if, if the trade's 15, 20, 30, uh, 50, let's say 20, 30 pips in profit, um, well, it may be, maybe that's your first target, so maybe that's a little bit too much. But maybe if you've, hit, if you've gone 15 pips in profit, you could trail your stop five pips, something like that, three to one. So you are, you are reducing your risk because no one wants to see a, a trade go into a decent profit and then turn around and you to be stopped out uh, you know, at your stock price. It, you know, it, it makes sense to trail it a little bit, but I wouldn't be aggressive about it because markets, as you know, they move up, they move down, they move up, they move down, they retest the entry point. Uh, you don't want to have the, the, the stop take you out of the position too early just before the expected move happens. So that, that's my best advice. Just be conservative, do trail it, but, but don't be too aggressive about it. I spent 10 minutes on the education. I'm gonna do a little bit of that each week because the more I talk to you guys, the more I'm gonna figure out what you need, the advice, because I'm sure you know, the, the majority of you are all dealing with the same issues. You know, these are the issues that I dealt with when I first started trading. And I've made these mistakes over and over again. And this is the only reason that I've learned how to figure this out for myself, how to deal with these situations. Okay, let's get on with looking at the markets. Okay, if you've been following me uh, for the last four webinars, however many I've done, you will know that I've been talking about precious metals 
I've expected moves to the downside. Gold and silver, and of course, they've been going down beautifully. So well happy with that. The, the chart for gold still looks quite negative, so I'm not even going to bother showing it to you. Um, I think we can go down uh, quite a lot further. Whether that happens this week or not, we, we're showing we, we are oversold. We are stabilizing a little bit. We've got two little uh, candles uh, moving sideways in gold over the last two days, and that might be something that continues into this week. But I certainly don't see any reason to buy gold right now. Silver also has been going down. In fact, silver's really been leading the way down uh, as far as the gold and silver pair are concerned. That, that, you know, gold started moving lower before, sorry, silver started moving lower before gold. Right, gold is now about to hit the 61.8% fib. Now, I just wanted to blow that up so you could see it. That fib level on the monthly chart, we're looking at the monthly chart, that fib level goes back to uh, March 2020. So it's over two years old. It's a big longer term fib level. You can only really see it on the monthly chart. And there's a blue 100 month moving average line there. That's at 1847. The fib level is at 1865. So we're about to hit a very important support level in silver. We're not that oversold on the monthly chart, but when you look at the weekly chart, we really are. I probably can't get that in the screen at the moment. The weekly chart were very oversold. The daily chart, which I can show you, we've been oversold for a, for a little while now. So the, we've got some dojis on the, on the, on the, um, on the daily chart. That, that's not particularly bullish. It doesn't mean that the market's definitely going to bounce, but it's, it is showing stability. It's showing a balance between buyers and sellers. The market opens, it probes up, it probes down, and then closes unchanged. And it's done that most for the last three days. We've got a slight green body on the last candle on Friday. So we're clearly entering some sort of period of stability. It's already happened. It's been confirmed with those doji patterns just as we head towards or hold just above the um, big support level 1865, 1845. As I said, I personally wouldn't be getting into a long position just yet. I would need more than three dojis to convince me to be buying in, into a bull trend, even though we're at strong support levels. I, f I would feel more comfortable if we actually test 1865, 1845. Then we get some sort of bullish candle off there and that might convince me to get into a long position. So it's a wait and see situation at the moment, but I just wanted you to be aware, especially if you're short, that we are heading into a big support level in silver and we've got to be aware of that. Now, whether that has an effect on gold or not, I do not know, but I certainly, as I say, I don't see anything positive in gold right now. This dollar has been going up since 2008. We've had a really good run and more recently, well, well we, we've been having a great run since, uh, well, June, or beginning of the year. Anyway, gold, uh, the dollar's just been, been pushed up, pushed up, speculation about higher interest rates. Now, we had a really important longer term FIB level at 106.60. You will know about that if you've uh, followed me for the last two or three weeks. Uh, I was concerned that we already had a double top there um, when I talked last week, but we didn't. We broke up through it and we're well through 106.60. We're trading, we traded at 107.00 by the close. Now, slightly concerning is this candle, what do we call it? Shooting star, gravestone doji, something like that. Clearly, uh, prices pushed up on Friday the way they should do in a bull market, but that gain, the game could not be sustained. Some sellers came in or some profit takers came in. The market retraced, closed unchanged. Now, again, this is not a sell signal. We've broken above important resistance levels. Uh, I wouldn't dream of being short the dollar right now, personally. Uh, if, you, if you've got your reasons, fair enough. Put them in the comments box. I'd love to read them, uh, but I'm just not seeing it, okay? Uh, we could enter a period of stability. It's quite normal for this market, for every market, to go sideways for a while, a couple of weeks, form a bear flag, form a descending triangle, form a pennant, something like that, continuation pattern, before we get the next leg higher. I think that's what's going to happen based on what I'm seeing, uh, based on the fact that we've broken above important resistance levels, uh, but I'd love to hear your comments. On the educational bit, I, I talked about earlier on about scaling in and, and waiting. Oh, wait for the level. That was something I wanted to say. Wait for the level. If you've done your analysis and you've identified a good support level with a 30 pip stop and a 60 pip target or whatever, don't jump the gun. Don't start buying it ahead of the support level, you know, because you're worried. It's that fear of missing out. You're worried that we're not going to quite get to the support level. Believe me, I've done this hundreds of times. Oh, I'm buying it 30, 20 pips ahead of the level because I just, I fear that I'm going to miss the trade. Too many times I've missed a trade by two, three pips and it's frustrating. I don't want to do that this time. The market's hovering above the level. I talk myself into buying it because I talk, I, I convince myself that we're never going to quite get to my level. Don't do it. You have to be prepared to miss trades. The reason you can't do it is if you've worked out a trade where you're going to risk 30 to make 50, 60 pips or whatever, if you're buying it 20 pips above the level, you still have to have your stop where you originally placed it. Otherwise, you're going to have your Otherwise, you're going to be exiting the trade exactly at the level where you should be buying it because you bought it too early. Does that make sense? If you've now increased your stop to 50 and your target is, is 30, 30 or 40 pips above, 
you're going to end up risking more than, you're, than you think you're going to make on the trade. So you've, at, you've got to be prepared to miss trades. You've got to wait for the level. Uh, uh, and if you miss it, you miss it. Move on to the next trade. That's something I wanted to add. Now, please, let me hear your comments about these, uh, these ideas that I have for you. Maybe you figured out something that's better. Maybe you like my idea, or maybe you, 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 you want to, um, you, if you need more information, let me know. But I really want to hear your comments. Okay, Aussie dollar. The, the dollar has, a, has been strong. Uh, the Aussie has been in a, a, a negative trend against the dollar for a significant period of time. Again, punctuated with long periods of sideways trending markets, which I hate. Um, it looks like we're consolidating. I don't see any buy signal here. We have come off. Actually, let me just show you something. Okay, this is the weekly chart. Now take it from me. We have, uh, we have Fib levels going back to November 2020. There's a 50% Fib there. So we've retraced 50% of that move from November 2020 up to, uh, up to, let's have a look, is that right? Yeah, something like that. No, early 2020. And yeah, it's about a year's rally's worth. Let me try and get the whole thing on the screen for you instead of trying to look at it off screen. Anyway, there you go. Let's get the whole picture. Um, so from early 2020, it was actually March 2020, up to the beginning of 2021, we had a beautiful year-long rally, really strong rally as, as, um, as the Aussie pushed higher. Uh, and then, of course, we've had this gradual, it was quite a gradual move down. Okay, so we're now testing the 50% Fib. We've retraced 50% of that move from early 2020 up to, up to early 2021. And there is a little trend line, I say little, it's getting on for a year old now, that we've bounced off. I don't, I personally wouldn't actually be buying it here. I think that's too risky. But we are, consi we are consolidating uh, just as the dollar index is consolidating. So we've got a good resistance level around 68.80, 68.90. If you're a subscriber, um, I've already uh, sent you out a chart with, with, with all my comments on the chart so you can keep that for the week. But there's the resistance level as I see it for, uh, for Monday as we open. Okay, Japanese yen. Now, at one stage, I thought this was could be forming a head and shoulders top. I'm going to show you the hourly chart now. Um, at some stage during the week, I was thinking, okay, this could be a head and shoulders top. This could be the left shoulder, this could be the head, this could be the right shoulder here. And there would have been a neckline somewhere like this, uh, which actually was a, was a great support level if you bought down there. Uh, 135, 135 double 13480 was my buy level. Uh, it was the 500 week moving, uh, 500 hour moving average. There was a fib line there, which I haven't got on here. Uh, it's on my longer term chart. And there was, of course, this potential neckline to the head and shoulders. So three reasons why that was a big support level in the dollar yen. And of course that, well, I say worked well. We, we, we got a decent enough bounce, but there's been a lot of sideways action. Now, going back to the, I don't think this is a head and shoulders pattern now. This, this right shoulder is going on far too long. So, uh, it was worth buying at what I thought was the neckline because it turned out to be a really good support level and it held. <clears throat> but now, look, I think we're just going to trade sideways. We've got, again, doji, 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 four dojis on the, on, the, um, on the dollar yen. It looks like we're consolidating, going to trade sideways. And my guess is that eventually we'll break higher and the yen will weaken again. We'll see what happens with that. But of course, the dollar looks pretty strong and there is no reason to sell that pair. Euro versus the US dollar. Well, that's been kind to us insofar as uh, we had support around 130, well, we had what I thought could have been a double bottom. When the dollar index was looking like it had formed a double top, just below that 106.60, the dollar index, below that 106.60 important fib, resi fib resistance, I was then looking at this potential double bottom in the euro. Okay, I thought, well, potential double top in the, in the, um, in the dollar index, potential double bottom in the euro, maybe that's it, maybe we're going to reverse. Well, we didn't reverse. Uh, in the end, we, we got a little bounce off there. But once we broke the 103.50 uh, level, I, I had a stop at 103.25, stop and reverse into a short position. Uh, now, if you guys did that, then you've done really nicely. Um, we plunged 300 pips. That was a 300, up to 300 pips. I mean, no one's going to run it for 300 pips, I know. But we got near parity, 1007 on Friday. Wow, that's seven pips away from parity. Um, whoever thought that we might see that. Um, We've got a, a, a good bounce off there. We're not particularly oversold on the, on the daily chart. We're just getting into oversold territory. So I don't, I'm, I'm not seeing this as a buying opportunity myself, but I do think that we can have some stability above one, one double O double O. Um, fair enough. It's a very psychological level, of course. Parity with the dollar is, is a big psychological factor in this. Uh, obviously some shorts decided they were going to take some profit at, at, around that parity area. We've now got a green body candle with a very long lower wick making a decent hammer, which of course is quite a bullish 
candle because it shows that the buyers came in aggressively. Now, you know, if you're short, you're seeing the market down as, as expected and you're happy because you're short. And then we've got this little bear trap now where anyone selling during the day into a fresh short position because you think we've broken the previous lows is now trapped in a losing position by the time Friday comes along. We've got the little green body, we've got the little hammer, indicates that probably for now the downside is done. But I favour more of a, a consolidation move to this move sideways rather than this being a buy signal. I'm not going to, I don't think we're going to get a trend change on one candle. Um, now, I don't know how far we can go. We've got the first resistance at around 102.00. We've got the second resistance at around 102.70, 102.80. How far this little bounce goes, I don't know. The frustrating point with this is we're not going to know what the parameters are of the sideways trend for a few days. So we have to just rely on the FIB levels, which are around 102.00, around 107.70, 102.80. Now, it is worth selling into those resistance levels, I believe, because as I said, I don't think that this is a buy signal. I think it's just a, a sign that we're going to trade sideways, just as I, uh, that's how I interpreted it too for the US dollar with that um, sort of gravestone doji. Have a quick look at crypto. I don't think there's many people trading crypto anymore. Um, it's pretty much died. Volatility's died. I imagine volume's died. Uh, trying to make a recovery in Bitcoin. We couldn't get past the 200 week moving average. I've talked about this, the red 200 week moving average. Um, we, we've closed below it for the first time ever. I talked about this last week. Now we've bounced back to it. Uh, 22,464 is the exact value as it stands right now. We got to 2,000, uh, we got to 22,484. Wow. We got to within 20 pips. We got 20 pips above the 200 week moving average and turned around. So clearly I wasn't the only person who thought that that would be a resistance level. Clearly there were some sell orders up there and that has worked. So look, uh, pressure remains to the downside as far as I can see in Bitcoin. This to me looks like a bear flag. Let's put some trend lines on it. Um, we can't be sure, of course, until we break the lower parameter of that flag, but it looks pretty much like a bear flag to me. So therefore, uh, for, for Bitcoin, a break below 19,480 is the exact price would be, uh, would, would likely trigger the next move lower, the next leg lower in this horrifying bear trend, horrifying if you're long, lovely if you're short. And of course, I have predicted this whole move down since the 16th of November. So I really hope that I've helped you either make some money or saved you a fortune. If I managed to get you out in the beginning of the year, then I've done my job. Um, Ripple just looks negative. There's just nothing else to say. Ethereum, which is the other one of the three that I follow. Um, decent bounce to very good resistance at 1250, 1275. Well, I had 1250, 1300 on my report. But certainly that's the exact high, bang in the middle, 1275 was the high. So um, again, bears coming in. These crypto markets just keep falling at the first hurdle. Um, and uh, the outlooks just looks negative. Uh, we're going to really have to see a, at least a break above, well, for, for crypto, a break above 13, uh, for, for Ethereum, a break above 1300. And for um, Bitcoin, of course, we've got to get through 23,000. So we can at least get above the 200 week moving average. EuroCAD was a, a nice opportunity during the week. We had this sort of sideways uh, channel for quite a while. What was that, two and a half months? Um, I speculated that we could bounce off that, that trend line again. Of course, why not? It's a solid trend line, tested three times, four times actually. This was quite a bullish candle off that trend line, but it wasn't to be, we broke lower. So any longs were stopped out, we reversed into a short position. And of course, that's worked beautifully because the markets dropped significantly. Now, we, we could bounce back and we could retest that. 133.80, 134.00. That's going to be the strong resistance level. <clears throat> but we're 200 pips away from that right now. So it's not really a realistic proposition right now. Just wanted to make you aware of it. This does look pretty negative. We have been trending down for a long time. Weekly chart, clearly. Uh, there we go. And there's your consolidation pattern. You know, with, with the, the, mark, the, the chart is littered with them, of course. That's what happens in a bear trend. Just be aware if we do uh, get back up to that resistance level, but I don't see any reason to be buying into the Euro CAD either. The Swiss, this was actually brought, brought to my attention by one of my subscribers asked me to have a look. I stopped looking at the dollar Swiss a long time ago because it really just was trading sideways for so long. In fact, look at this weekly chart. Uh, actually, that is the weekly chart. That, you know, so a period, long periods of sideways action, which just bores me silly. So I stopped following it, but I'm quite glad that someone got me to look at it again because there was a great opportunity down here at this support level, very clear support level, 38.2% here, 500 week moving average, backed up by the 200 week moving average, and even we've got a rising trend line there. 
just above the level, just below the level. So <clears throat> I suggested a long position and the market kindly hit the buy level, uh, which was just above the 100 day moving average as well. And we've soared. Now this, this looks pretty strong. I think, I think the dollar Swiss can continue to push higher. US stock markets about two weeks ago, I suggested that the stock markets had bottomed out, or was it three weeks ago? Um, for good reason. The S&P was not showing a reason to bottom out. The only reason I suggested it would is because the NASDAQ and the Dow Jones were. We'll have another quick recap of that in, as, uh, as I look at those. Uh, but the, but the, Dow uh, the S&P has bounced back quite nicely. We're testing, we're testing resistance around uh, sort of 39.10, 39.20. You can see we've got this trend line here coming in at around 39.25. We're, so once we break above 39.25, and I think it will happen eventually, but as I've suggested in my reports, it's, been, it's going to be a slow crawl higher. And unfortunately, I've been right. It's a slow crawl, difficult to hold a long position, but I think, I think it is right to hold a long position. I think we will break higher. Um, interesting, that non-farm payroll number on Friday, 300 and whatever it was, uh, almost 100,000 more than the estimate, uh, didn't have a huge effect on the stock markets. So they did push up a little bit. Uh, well, actually, no, look, this is Friday, isn't it? Uh, so, so a really strong employment number didn't push the markets higher, although I actually feared that the, the, the stock markets would turn around and go down on that number. Worries about, you know, uh, higher interest rates, maybe bigger increases, more increases, but that hasn't hit the market. So I guess that is encouraging to my theory that the stock markets can make this slow recovery through the summer. This would be a lovely target. 40, 80, 40, 90, 500 week, uh, 500 day moving average, a big 38.2% fib, previous swing low down here, uh, in uh, February. So that, that's going to be the big level. By the time we get there, this 100 day moving average is going to be dropping quite quickly to that level two. So the, the, the key, the key levels really for me are 39, 20, 39, sorry, 39, 10, 20, 39, 10, 39, 20, a break above 39, 30 should be a buy signal for this week. And it could actually take us 150 points higher up towards that 40, 80 area. We'll see. We'll talk about that next week. Um, now the reasons that I was calling for this recovery in the stock markets was because the NASDAQ had a big support level down at 10,800, 10,000, yeah, 10,800, 10,700, big fib, fib level. Look, the 200 week moving average was there anyway, the red line. When you look at the monthly chart, you can then see the fib levels, which I know you've probably seen last week, but I'm gonna show you again. We had the 50 month moving average uh, support there as well. The fibs go all the way back to 2008. That was the global financial crisis crash low. That's how far you've got to have your FIB levels go back sometimes. Uh, and that just clearly identifies this as a, such a beautiful support level. We didn't quite get there. We got to 11,036, if I remember correctly. Yes, yes, it is. A bounce off there. So that would have been one of those frustrating times that I've just talked about. Wait until you get to the level before you buy it. So your risk um, reward uh, ratio works out. Well, that would have been one of those horrible situations where you would have missed the trade and watched the market. Uh, recover without being in a long position. Anyway, uh, right, the NASDAQ is, is testing 50-day moving average resistance. We've got that around 12,185. We've got a little trend line around 12,250. So we're going to have to get up through there to get to three, uh, 12,350, 12,400. If we get through 12,400, then things really start to look good for the NASDAQ. We can start seeing a really decent recovery. We've just got a few little obstacles there. Now, the Dow Jones was the one that just kissed at the support level and then took off. That was a beauty. Let me show you again on the weekly chart. I know I showed you last week, so uh, you already have seen this, but let's look at it again on the monthly chart. We had the big, there we go. This chart again goes back to the uh, global financial crisis crash low in 2008, 2009. Uh, there's your fibs, 23.6% uh, 23 fib at 29,664, and the low was, 29,741. So again, didn't quite get there. So, uh, and then we've bounced off it, but that, that support level clearly did hold. Uh, and we're seeing a good recovery, a slow recovery as I kind of expected, but we've got to the first FIB levels of around 31,400 and we're, we're stumbling there. We get through 31, sort of 500 next week. And I think we can do it. We'll, we'll continue to crawl up. The first stop for me would be 31,800. Uh, but again, why not? Why can we not, uh, maybe by the end of August, Get as far as 32,400, 32,500. We've got a good 38.2% uh, resistance level there. We've got the 500 day moving average there. We've got this trend line as well coming in at around 32,500. And by the time we get there, the blue 100 day moving average will probably also be lending weight to that area. So if we get there, uh, that will probably be a really nice 
a potential short position to see if um, the bear trend continues. Look, we've even got a little trend line there. Uh, so that really is a good level. Anyway, we'll examine that if we get there next week or sometime in July. I think that's it. I think that's everything that I wanted to cover today. I wanted to just give you kind of a broad look across metals and Forex, the dollar, the yen, the stock markets, even, even uh, crypto. And I've done that, talked about some education. Right, that's it for me for today. Please send me your comments. Please send me your questions. Anything you want me to cover next week, stick that in the comments box as well. Um, I will try and do something similar in the middle of the week. I'm going to try and go live. Right, listen, sorry, tried to go live yesterday. I completely cocked it up, never done it before. So all you've got was me punching around on my keyboard with a green screen behind me. So it was quite hilarious. Um, I hope you found that entertaining. But hopefully uh, today's webinar is a lot more helpful. Um, that's it. So, um, please have a look at my website, daytradeideas.co.uk.